no cheat. It's there on purpose. It's so that uh, later through the day, whether it be at lunch or whether it be as you gather as a family after the service, you can sit and share your insights with one another through the lesson that we partake of this morning. It is there so that parents, you can hold your children responsible for listening and you can tell them what a child heard when Mr. Wilson spoke this morning. That's a good thing to do. We had a deacon in our church in Germany that uh, he said, I gained a lot of insight from listening to what the kids heard because they hear it with different ears. I want to recommend a couple books to you before we begin this morning. One written by a very scholarly man and one written by a man who was, uh, today we'd call him a handyman. He was a tinker. The first one is a book called The Holy War by John Bunyan, not Paul Bunyan, John Bunyan. Bunyan, while he was in Bedford Jail, which Lucy and I visited some years ago outside, uh, he was there in prison for 14 years because he preached the gospel. He had a family of a number of children, one of them who was blind. His daughter would stand outside the walls of the prison and say, Father, we need you at home. Please don't preach anymore. And he would say, I must. And he would stand on one side of the wall and the congregation of his assembly would stand on the other side and he would preach the gospel. But during that time, the 14 years that he was in jail till there was a new king or a new queen in England, Bunyan wrote a book that is probably the single greatest bit of English literature ever written outside the Bible called Pilgrim's Progress. You should read Pilgrim's Progress once a year. It's, a, it's an allegory about how God saves people. The Holy Wars was written because when he published Pilgrim's Progress, they accused him of plagiarizing Bacon, not pig Bacon, the author Bacon. And in order to prove that he, a simple tinker, a simple man who repaired household appliances and such, to prove that he had not plagiarized Bacon by writing Pilgrim's Progress, he wrote The Holy Wars, which is the Lucifer's pursuit of a man in his saved condition and the ways that he goes about doing it. If you want to know why things happen in your life, and we have been enjoined that way in the sermons that Pastor Ryan has been teaching on James, read The Holy War. It explains to you why Satan doesn't quit on you. Satan could let you float along before when you were his. Now he wants to destroy you. He roams around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The second is written by a man at the opposite end of the, of the uh, educated spectrum, a man named John Owen. Same time frame, 15 to 1600. And this is called the mortification of sin. Do you want to know how to be victorious over sin? Do you? Read this. John MacArthur has delivered a sermon called Hacking Agag to Death based upon this book. Get this book and read it, okay? Having said that, you've done the book review. Stand, if you would, and turn with me to the 10th chapter of John. And we're going to visit a familiar passage this morning. We're going to go back to something we learned a while ago, but we, we, it needs repeating. And I want to read to you starting in verse 22 through verse 30. Jesus is speaking... It says, at that time, John gives us a demarcation between what um, in chapter 10 happens first, and then at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place. Now, let me fill in a, a little bit of information for you at this point. Around the same time that we celebrate what we call Christmas, the Jewish world celebrates Hanukkah. This is Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. This is not a religious holiday in Judaism. This is a day in 164 BC 
the 25th of Kislev, when Israel went back and purified their temple and rededicated it to service to the Lord. I find it really appropriate that Jesus stands and says this as they are celebrating worshiping him in a purified place. Don't you? Jesus says it took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple of the portico of Solomon. Now, he wasn't out in the courtyard where he normally was. Why? John tells us it's winter and he wanted to stay warm while he was teaching. So he goes inside the hall of Solomon that was in this temple. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, Christ is a Greek word, Christos, it means ruler, God, uh, the one above everyone else. The Hebrew word is Mashiach, Messiah. Tell us if you are the Messiah. Tell us openly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish ever. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Why? That's my why. I and the Father are one. Let's pray. Yahweh, we come today to this glorious time in human history. You have brought us to the table to remind us of just how incapable we are and how fully you have supplied. Life's great questions are answered at this table. The Holy One came. The Holy One lived. The Holy One died and was resurrected. And as we have partaken of it, we have remembered what it took to get us to this point in human history. We thank and praise you, Yahweh, and we pray that you be glorified in what your people do this day and that what you learn of you. Amen. Be seated, please. Just before Thanksgiving, I received this, uh, this email. A friend of ours for a number of years, a man who has several degrees, in his history, he's well titled. He's an author of several books. And he, we've witnessed to him for years. He says, quote, remember that I'm not much of a churchgoer, but I have faith in special providence. And he capitalizes providence. The same providence that Bismarck said protected drunkards, little children, and the United States of America. That providence saved me a few times on a drop zone, on a frozen tundra, in a VA hospital. That providence also brought me my dear wife and life partner. Partner, I can only hope that the same providence has saved you a few times. I wrote him back. I said, John, just call it God. Don't put another name and call it providence. Just call him God. Please acknowledge him. I love you, and I pray for your soul. You have any people like that in your life? No matter what you do, no matter where you turn, they won't acknowledge God. And without that acknowledgement, there is no salvation. Our depravity, learned in the garden, is debilitating. So what are we to do about it? If we can't do anything, oh, by the way, you like the picture? 
<laughs> that John Owen is the same John Owen I gave you the, the quote from. What are we to do about this, this incapacitating situation that we live in? What are we to do? We're all part of a world that is populated by hell-deserving sinners. Why? All have... What? And come short of the glory of God. That for which we were created, we are incapable of performing. We were created to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But that was ruined in the garden. And it passes on to each one of us. There are no exceptions to that. The littlest child that comes out of that, out of that nurturing womb is born a sinner. It does not learn. Did any of you have to teach your kids to sin? Uh, they knew it innately, didn't they? We are all marked for death because of rebellion. And it is appointed unto man, what? Once to die. And then comes the judgment that follows. Now, in light of those truths, there are three questions on your outline that all men are faced with, and I want to give you those questions and some answers to it. The first question is, what if any is the ground on which a holy God can forgive guilty sinners, then see them as righteous, receive them into his fellowship, and eventually welcome them into heaven? The Bible answer is only by mercy, only by grace only by the manifested righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ can man come to be restored to his intended purpose and fulfillment and the joy of doing what you were created to do. Jesus puts it this way in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. There is no ancillary way. There's no other way. There's no plan B. It is simply through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter on the day of Pentecost in his sermon said, There is no other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. It is in Christ. It is in Emmanuel. It is within God within us. So, salvation... One is by grace alone, because God had to do that for us. We needed what Jesus Christ alone could do, and God graciously gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he wasn't emotional about you. He did what you needed. That's love. Love is a verb. It's doing something. You can tell your your wife or your children that you love them day in and day out, but until you prove it by your actions, it's simply a word, right? God loved us and he did what he gave. And who did he give? He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. So, it is sola gratia, by grace alone, that we are redeemed. Okay, what then? The next question. By what means does a hell-deserving sinner receive this grace? Paul explains simply in the first chapter of Romans. In chapter 1, in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power, it's the dunamis, we get our word dynamite from it. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, to faith as it is written, but the righteous one will live by faith. Later on, he writes Ephesians, and in chapter 2, he says in verse 8 and following, for by grace... Sola gratia, you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no man may boast. 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God beforehand prepared so that we would walk in them. By faith alone, sola fide, that grace, sola gratia, that God gives to us is applied to us in faith, in sola gratia, in, in sola fide, which he grants to us. God is the, Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our, so it is nothing innate in me. Yes, I have faith. Every man has natural faith. Most of us are going to leave here this morning. We're going to step inside an enclosure with wheels on it. We're going to stick a key in the ignition switch, and we're going to turn on thousands of tiny explosions immediately at our feet and hope it doesn't kill us. That's faith. Many of you this morning walked up to a faucet. You turned the handle on top of the faucet. You don't know what they're doing at that plant over there on Mark Sheffel, do you? And you took a drink of that stuff, and you don't know what's in it. You exercise natural faith. Supernatural faith is the faith to believe what God says in his word about himself. And you do not have that lying nascent within you, lying within you potentially, and then one day you magically exercise that thing. No, God plants that in you and gives you that faith to believe what he says. Those first two questions are answered. It's at the third question, which is to concern us this morning. Those of us who believe, how do the first two, how were they brought together? Do we need to question our profession of faith? You hurt Pastor Kurt this morning, didn't you? He said, to do what before you took of the table? Examine yourself and examine yourself about what? Whether you be in the faith. So we are called on to examine our safe faith, our faith. Scripture tells us to. In Matthew chapter 7, at the end of the greatest sermon that has ever been preached and recorded for man, because we don't know every sermon that he preached, but Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, gathered before him. And near the end of that sermon, in verse 21, we read this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. We are told that there is a faith which is not a believing faith. You have faith in a system, perhaps. You have faith in an individual whose judgment you trust. You have faith that your parents didn't take you someplace that would be harmful for you, and so you follow what the people at that place tell you to do. Any number of things, but those are not saving faiths. You are to judge your faith. A little further on in Matthew 13, the Lord writes, it tells a parable about some seed and a sower and some soils. The judgment there is of temporary faith, not empty faith, not vain faith, as in the first case, but temporary faith. He says, starting in verse 18 of Matthew 13, hear then the parable of the sower. This is a parable about who? The sower, not the seed, not the soil, not the crop, but the one doing the sowing. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes along and snatches away that which has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. And the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky place, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but is only temp it is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. 
and the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Beloved, please hear me. You're going to hear this word this morning clearly and simply proclaimed to simple people by a simple person. Will everyone respond the same way? No. Many of you sat for many, many, many sermons, many, many, many Sunday school lessons, the witness of dear faithful pe people telling you constantly, and you did not respond. A lot of things are going to hold you off from that. Jesus describes three of them here, which include most of mankind. There is, gladly, at the end of this ex explanation, the seed which is sown in good soil. He's talking about the gospel being indiscriminate. I like to tell people that when they evangelize, it's like having the flu. Just go ahead and sneeze. Go ahead and evangelize. It's not up to you to determine where it falls. And the gospel is indiscriminate. You live the gospel every day by your actions and occasionally with your words, right? Go ahead. Let God take control of what he does with that seed when it hits the soil that he has directed it toward. So there is empty faith. There is temporary faith. And believe it or not, in James chapter 2, there is a third kind of faith. Verse 17, listen to it. Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Oh, that's good. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. <laughs> I can think of three occasions when Jesus approached a demon and those demons immediately recognized who he was. And those demons are lost. The third kind of faith is possible to have is demonic faith. So, that brings question three. How can I know that my professed faith will serve me in the judgment day when I'm that I'm truly one of the elect. Now, we're not looking for the grounds of salvation or the means of salvation, but a test of the genuineness of salvation. Is my faith real? Is it important if you have dead faith, demonic faith, temporary faith, shallow faith? Is it important? Yes. There is an eternity. I guarantee you. Now, I've never talked to anyone who's been there and come back. But I have a book that tells me about it. And I trust this book. I trust the author of this book. You say, well, it's just a book. Who can believe that stuff? Okay, you take your decision when we die, and I'll take mine. Which do you wish? The primary reason that we have to question and why we need to set it in place was covered before we took communion today. We are told to examine our faith. Believe it or not, you don't have the answer to that question in yourself. Why? Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You will lie to yourself about your salvation. What? What kind of fool would do that? I was saved before God saved me. You know what I'm talking about? I thought I was a Christian before God reached into that little Pharisee's heart and shook him to his core and said, no, you're not. You mean God came to you and did that? No, a guy opened the Bible and showed me why I was not saved. And God illumined me. God birthed me at that moment, and I believed. See? Nothing complex about that. 
And it's this, this examination of yourself is not some psychotic fixation that you dream up. You walk around constantly. You go to a church that has an altar call, and you're, you're the first one beaten a path. There's a burn mark from your chair to the, to the platform where you get down and pray every Sunday, Lord, if I'm not saved, please save me. It's not that. But when God moves on your wretched soul, You'll know it because salvation is knowing. It's not some mystical thing that happens and you have to hope from that point on. No, I have the surety of the word of God that I am a child of God and I have the spirit. We started Romans 8 and 9 this morning, right? If any man have not the spirit, he is none of God's. It's that simple. How do I know I have the spirit? Well, you speak in tongues. No, I ain't going to say that. Okay, that's not how it happens. I don't lay on the floor and bevel. I beg you, if you can answer and ask with any honesty at all, ask yourself this question. Your eternal soul rests on the answer to that question because there is an eternity coming regardless of what some of the people that believe in reincarnation and those other weird theories want to believe in. So, that brings us to our text in John chapter 10. You knew we'd get there, didn't you? Had to get there eventually. And you have to ask yourself, am I one of his sheep? There are three points to answer that question. There are the marks of a sheep, the privileges of a sheep, and the actions of a true sheep of God. And these are God's words, not mine. Verse 26 tells us a distinguishing mark of John 10. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. The religious ones in verse 24 had said, come on, don't keep us in suspense. Tell us openly you are the Christ. And Jesus answers them. Listen to the two, the two points that prove from Jesus himself. I told you, that's witness number one. I told you I am Christos. I am the Christ. I am Mashiach. I've told you that. Secondly, the works that I do. Now, how many witnesses are required in Judaism for a thing to be true? Two. Not one witness, not one eyewitness, but two. Jesus gave them the two things that are necessary, and they still did not believe. These two witnesses can free a man, or if he does not believe, they damn a man. Because to reject the words of Christ and the works of Christ is to guarantee yourself an eternity in damnation. At the core of it is, they refuse to believe either. You come to this church, and I guarantee you that when you come to this church, you'll have these witnesses born on you constantly. What did God say, and what does God do? Every one of you has access to both of those. A matter of fact, if you take your next breath, you have the witness of what God is doing in you. When did you learn to breathe? Loretta, when does it happen? You know, right? Yeah. And if you don't breathe, what does the doctor do? On that little hiney that just came out, right? Breathe. No one has to tell you to breathe, to take your next breath. They didn't lack testimony. They didn't lack evidence or affirmation. They lacked faith. In verse 36, uh, 26, we're told that. You're, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. A believer, a true sheep, is marked out by them embracing fully Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Salvation is cognitive. You know what you're doing. He doesn't act you. 
He doesn't ask you to do something that doesn't look like anything you've been doing around you. He simply asks you to believe the evidence. Uh, Jesus told of his, of his crucifixion. Peter looked at him and said, Lord, not you. At the end of John 6, Jesus gives the witness and most of the people around him leave. And Jesus looks at the disciples and says, are you going to leave too? You remember Peter's response? Lord, who shall we go to? You alone have the words of life. That's a believer. Faith is believing what Jesus said about himself, and it is evidenced by his works. The most used title by John in his gospel and in 1 John for someone that is truly saved is believer. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Go through his gospel. We call ourselves a lot of things, Christians, the saved, the born again. The biblical word for who you are this morning, if God has saved you, is you are a believer. And that's important because then we give definition to what it is that we believe. And that's why we come and we do Bible study and we open the word of God and we let it teach us what it is to be a believer so that we have better definition of that. I'm 81 years old. I've walked with the Lord for 72 years. Sometimes it's been a great journey. Other times it's been back to the woodshed. You know what I'm talking about. But I know him better today than I did on September 5th, 1952. I know him better. And I love him more because he loves me. Let me reduce it further even. A believer is one who lives a life molded by what they believe. Now we're getting into the show me your works end of what James is going to tell us. You will act out what you believe. Is that true? You're not going to act different from what is at your core. It's going to be that action which is taken, which exhibits itself, which becomes a life witness. I don't believe in a God of my own concoction, my own imagination, like the calf at the foot of Mount Sinai, but in a God of Scripture. And it changes me into his image. You see, the only way I know him is from this book. He gives definition. Yes, he witnesses to the lost world in his creation, and I can enjoy that as well, but I learned of him from this book. So you say, I want to be a better Christian. What do, what do I do? What's the first thing I tell you? Read your... It's his book. It's the Heilige Schrift, the holy letters in German, the uh, Sacra Biblia in Latin, okay? It's the books. And what are the books about? No, it's not about you. It's about him. And when I understand him, I understand me. Honestly, I know that there but for the grace of God go I. He changes me, progressive sanctification, into the image of his dear son. That's why we were called Christians. Christian is the diminutive form of Christ. We're little God, not like Benny Hinn wants to teach. We are not gods ourselves, or like the Mormon church teaches. We don't become planetary sovereigns. We are believers. And notice in verse 30, he says that he, he describes this union of he and the Father and us. He says, I and the Father are one. And that's in the neuter case. He means we're one thing. He's saying we're one things. And these Jews knew exactly what he was claiming at that point. Jesus is claiming to be God. And he's, he's answering the question back in verse uh, 24. He's, he's just pointedly telling them, 
I'm God, the Father and I are one, we are one thing. And how do, they, how do I know they believed it? Verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews, the Jews answered, for a good work we do not stone you. You know, I read that and I said, they must have been really a lot of miracles going on in that day for them not to look at the miracle and say only God can do that. You know what a miracle is, right? God doing this. Messing in the natural. Okay? And making something that shouldn't happen happen or something you don't imagine could happen. They must have been really, because look at what they said. For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man make yourself God. Why are they going to kill him? Because he claimed to be God. Was he God? Yes. They did not believe. We believe what he said about himself. We believe what he said about his works. Back in uh, verse 14, he, he gives an example in 14. He said, I'm the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for my sheep. And I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Do you believe what scripture says about Jesus? Do you believe Jesus is God? Do you? You should have jumped up and yelled yes at that point. We're too reserved for that, right? If you truly believe that, you will live that way. If you don't live that way, you don't believe that. Can I be that dogmatic? I'm 81 years old. I can do anything I want. <laughs> like that T-shirt that says, don't make old people mad. They control your future or your inheritance or something like that. Have you cast yourself upon Christ? Second Peter says, casting all your cares upon him. Why? For he cares for you. Do you do that? Or do you hold those things dear to your heart and say, oh, I'm going to worry about this until the cows come home? Dear friend, learn who he is. Learn about him. Learn of him. And you will learn him by what is in this book. You're not going to learn something philosophically, empirically. You're going to learn it practically as you sit down and apply the glutamus maximus to the chair. Open your Bible. People have died for this book to get it into the hands of people that don't have it. We have missionaries in areas that are learning languages that no human tongue can untangle so that this book can come into their hands. Treasure this book. Love the book. Be a person of the book. If you go to work and you can't carry a full-size one, go to Goodwill and they'll sell you one this size for a quarter that comes from the chapel system. Stick it in your pocket. And when they are not looking, and you're not, not when you're supposed to be working, but at that pause, open it up anywhere and read about him. Read about the God who loved you and sent his son to save you. So, second mark, the privilege of being a true believer. What happens because you are a believer? Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I will give eternal life to them and they will never perish ever and no one will snatch them out of my hand. To be known by him is more than just a general omniscience about you. In the sense of the word, you have an intimate, established relationship that is closer and more binding than any human relationship you will ever have. It says in Genesis that Adam knew his wife and she bore a child. God says of Israel, of you alone, of all people, have I known. 
Now, did he just know Israel and nobody else was recognized? No. There was an established bond, a love relationship committed between God and those that he knows. The intimacy is revealed in, in verse 3 of, verse 10, of chapter 10. To him, the right shepherd, the good shepherd, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Beloved, can you express love in any better way than that? You recognize the voice of someone that loves you. You respond to that voice. That one loves you and is going to do the very best that can be done for you. And you follow, trusting that voice. Now, unless you're here as an angel unaware, like in Hebrews, none of you have ever heard God's voice. So how do I listen to God? How does God vocalize to me? We're back at it. He's never going to tell you anything that this book does not validate in and of itself. There's nothing in this book that is corruptible. There is nothing in this book that needs revision. Our language changes. The Bible doesn't change. For a long time, I preached out of the King James when I was first in the pastorate. But then I found myself explaining what the old King James words meant. Like, when was the last time you ever said anon? Never said it, right? Mark uses it all the time. It means immediately. I found myself using the King James and explaining, and I looked at a new, a new American Standard, and it says what I was explaining. So I switched to the New American Standard. And about a year and a half ago, this thing called the Legacy Standard Bible came along, and it uses the New American Standard as a base, but it calls God Yahweh, which is his name, right? Right? So when I say Yahweh, I'm talking to him. The English Standard Version is beautiful. It makes sense to me. That's why the elders have chosen to make it the Bible that is used in the services here. I, I, I apologize. I didn't tell you. I was, okay, good. Okay, I didn't tell him I was going to use the LSB. So. <laughs> Are you secure in Christ? That's not rhetorical. Are you secure in Christ? How secure? God's hand. The sheep are in it. Jesus' hand. The sheep are in it. Who can get you out? When we get to the end of chapter 8 of Romans, Paul's going to make this remark. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he gives us three verses of everything you can imagine, and at the end he says everything else. You can never be lost once you are saved. Do you understand that? What harm can come to you if you are God's sheep? None. Peter says, if they kill you because of your faith, ah, uh, duh. He doesn't say that. That's what I refer to. Don't be afraid of persecution. Expect persecution. If there's no persecution, you're probably not giving them any reason to persecute you, right? Right? Think about that. The word snatch is used here in verse 28. It's used again back in verse 12, and it means literally to rip away from. It's a violent removal. It's not going to happen to you. Not one of his sheep has ever been lost. Not one of his sheep has ever been killed outside of the purview of God. Okay, lastly, third, what are the actions of a true sheep? Verse 27 says, they follow me. What does it mean that I hear his voice? In those days, when the Bible was written, the shepherds would have flocks that they were, most of them were 
hired to watch. Some were family treasures, and they were hired to watch. And when nighttime would start to come, they would all go to a central corral built out of stones. Uh, when we used to go on vacation, we'd go in Yugoslavia sometimes, and we would see the, the, the corrals built out of rocks taken from the fields. That's, most of that country is, is rock on top of rock on top of rock, and they find a little dirt in between. So they clear the rocks, and they make these big corrals, and the shepherds would all bring from the village, would bring their sheep into this one flock, this one sh uh, sheepfold where all the sheep were kept. In the morning, the shepherds went out. Guess what? He wouldn't go in and he'd look to see the brand. And I'm going to tell you what, sheep look like sheep look like sheep. Pretty much, you know, there, there, there are some with a Roman nose, you know, and other things like that, but it's pretty hard. So how do you get your sheep out? You say, hey, sheep, you know what he did to me? He said, Howard, did I hear his voice actually? No. But he said, when he walked up to Lazarus' tomb and the scent wafted out, proving he was dead, did he say, come forth? What was the first word he said? Lazarus. Why did he say his name? So that everybody wasn't resurrected. No, but we know that. But Lazarus was one of his sheep. Lazarus knew the voice. The sheep knew the voice of the one that loved them and cared for them. Read Psalm 23 and see what it's like between the relationship between a shepherd and the sheep. Each of his sheep hears him speak. I want you to be assured at this point. If you are one of God's sheep, you will be called. I don't know when it'll be. Some of you are when, how old was Calvin? six God called Calvin at six Ken how old were you how old were you when God called you okay anybody here saved when they were over 50 wow 45 okay I don't know when God's going to call you. It's not chronological. He does. That's the, that's the main thing. He does. But if you don't hear his voice, if you open the word, if you open the Bible and it's dead dull, if it's all grammatical, if it's all theoretical to you, there might be something wrong with what you're saying you are. And at that point, you know what you do. You call out to God, God, be gracious to me, a sinner. Admit what you are and admit who he is, according to what is in his word. You guys remember a lady named Lydia in Acts 16? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this one. Acts 16 and verse 14. I knew a lady in Kaiserslautern, Germany, named Lydia. She was Greek from the city of Thessalonica. We used to take our singles on Saturday night after we'd fed them, and we'd take them downtown to eat ice cream, and she had an ice cream parlor. And she'd always ask, well, what are you reading in the Bible now? And one night, uh, one of the young men said, we read about you today in the Bible. She said, what, me? And he opens the Bible in, in Acts 16 and says, is that your name in verse uh, Verse uh, 14, she said, uh, yes, I am Lydia. And she said, look, my hometown is Thyatira. Thyatira, same name, same town. It says a seller of purple. She sold ice cream. Some of it was purple. Okay. <laughs> she was a worshiper of God. Whoa. She was listening, whose heart the Lord opened to pay attention to the things spoken by Paul. So, if the Bible's dead to you, if God is dead to you, beg him, open my heart, call my name. Please, Lord, do that. Let's pray.
counsel you this while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. If you have questions about this, when we get ready to leave, I will be here at the front to speak with you, to try and answer your question from the Bible. Don't leave unsure. You've been told this morning. Leave knowing. And you can do that as the word is open to you. My wife will be here if you're not comfortable talking to a man. <coughs> Yahweh, we thank you for the salvation you've worked in our hearts. We thank you for one day calling us. We thank you for the, the goodness and the mercy and the love that is spread abroad in our hearts. And we pray that be true for any that are here without Christ this morning. Use these simple words from this broken vessel restored to youthfulness and wholeness by your grace. Bring that person to you, Father, in Christ's name, amen.